Hey friends, it's your friendly neighborhood witch Wickedy here. And in this video, I'm going to be going over my top tips for starting a new game in the 1.4 update. Most of these I've been going over a little bit while I've been playing my chickadee farm let's play, but I figured I'd compile it all here for easy access. If you haven't been watching my let's plays, be sure to check them out. I'll link the playlist in the description below. All right, let's get into Wickedy's 23 Stardew tips and tricks. It may be tempting to chop down every single tree you see in the first few days of spring because gathering wood is very important for crafting. But it's important to not get too ahead of yourself on the first day. Just get enough to make a chest or two and leave the rest be. You only need 100 experience points to get your first foraging level up, which is roughly nine trees, less if you've been foraging around the map, which I recommend doing on the first day. Why? Well, once you reach level one foraging, the trees you chop down can drop seeds. They won't before that though. And these seeds can be crafted into field snacks to get more energy to chop down more trees. So get that level up before you get all lumberjack crazy. Do you want even more trees and seeds? Well, leave those stumps alone. First off, they give you less wood for energy compared to trees. And second, tree stumps spread seeds out. It's a great way to get more seeds for crafting field snacks or trees to grow without you having to plant them yourselves. And don't forget to shake those full grown trees as you walk by too. When you are clearing your farm, mines, and all around, you'll frequently find mixed seeds. Planting and tending these seeds can be a huge help as some of the seeds can be worth upwards to 150 gold. These seeds give 100% profit as they are free and only take your time and energy. If you're planting them in the spring, be sure not to plant them past the 15th because one of the crops is a cauliflower and it would just be wasted. My favorite thing about mixed seeds is saving them for the fall time. It is possible to grow the artichokes from these seeds in year one, when otherwise you'd have to be lucky at the traveling merchant or wait until fall year two to have access to these seeds. Definitely worth planting to me. Most people know that during spring, you should be checking for spring onions any day that you can. It's a great source of free energy, but another place you should be checking semi-regularly is the beach, specifically on Saturday. All week long, forageables have been popping up all over the map and they will stay until you pick them up or the weekly reset, which is Sunday morning. So I like to go beachcombing and foraging on Saturdays. It saves you from having to check every day of the ocean, Around the other areas of the map, it's good to pick them up as you go because there is a limit of six forageables in each area, but the beach is just a little different, especially having the tide pools unlocked. When foraging in early spring, it might be a good idea to get your foraging skill up to level four before the 15th of spring. Why? Well, that's when salmonberry season starts. With level four foraging, you get two berries per berry bush, which can be immensely helpful for energy, for exploring the mines and for watering your crops. I can sometimes still have salmon berries left over in the first weeks of fall by making sure to get this level up and collect those berries. While you may be tempted to sell your golden star horseradishes and daffodils in springtime, it's definitely worth it to hold on to them for making spring seeds. Unless you have the botanist profession at level 10 foraging, it is always more profitable to mush your seasonal forageables together and craft the seed packets to sell, then selling the items individually. The exception to this are the winter seeds, which are worth more selling individually. You do get 30 seasonal seeds per seasonal foraging bundle done. I personally like to plant these 30 each season and use the yield to craft seed packets to sell. It's like printing my own money. If you are planting seasonal seeds, the crops they grow are forageables. So with that said, you don't have to worry about having a helpful scarecrow guardian keeping the crows away because the crows won't even attack them. One of the things that I love about crops with multiple harvests is that it saves me so much time for the next season. When the plant dies out at the start of a new season, the ground will still be tilled, saving a lot of precious time and energy. Or you could just plant a cheap crop, such as wheat in the ground, at the end of the season to hold the tilled spot until you feel like rotating it out. 
With the 1.4 update, we have been introduced to a couple of new waterless crops. In the springtime especially, this can be a huge help. You'll find rice shoots from dig spots, treasure chests, and from bugs down in the mines. Once you plant these near a water source within three tiles, you don't need to water them at all. Just watch them grow and harvest them when you're ready. Such an energy saver. The next crop is the tea sapling. Not only are these super cheap to make, once it's planted, you don't have to water it at all. Tea does take 20 days to grow, but it can be harvested every day of the last week of the season, even winter if it's indoors. Strawberries can be one of the most profitable crops in the spring season, especially if you can plant them at the beginning of the season. Unfortunately, in the first year, you can't get seeds for these until the egg festival on the 13th. And they are pricey. But when you plant the strawberries on the festival night, you can get two harvests before spring is over. But what not everyone knows is that you can get a third harvest from 20 of these by using the gifts given to you from the spring crops bundle. If you plant the needed crops for this bundle on the first day of spring, you'll have everything you need to finish the bundle the night of the festival and grab your 20 speed grow. Put those on 20 of your newly planted strawberry seeds and you'll be able to get one extra harvest from these on the last day of spring. Fishing can be a little tricky, especially at low levels and with a hand-me-down rod. With the 1.4 update, there is a new rod introduced, the training rod, and it is definitely not to be overlooked. This rod will only catch low level fish, anything that's worth less than 50 gold, and the quality of the fish caught doesn't change at all, but you can use this rod early on to build up your fishing experience and fast. One common method used is to not bother with a far cast, just cast close to you for time efficiency's sake, and try to get as close to perfect catches as you can. This is so much easier to do with this rod and the experience gain is the same as any other rod. Very helpful for getting your skill up higher to buy a better rod if you find it difficult to fish early on with a bamboo pole. Especially in the early game, I suggest that you pay attention to where your skills are at in the morning and then throughout the day as you're working on any specific skill. You'll see me often staying out way past my bedtime and sometimes even overexerted. This is because I know that if I leveled up at least one skill during the day, even if I pass out, I will not have to pay an energy penalty in the morning. Your energy will be completely full. And to top that off, if you don't keep any money on hand or much money at all, you won't have to pay a fine or pay just a very small fine to the wandering Jojo members that drug your sorry passed out self back home. Take that, Joja. If you are working on a completionist farm or trying to get the community center finished as soon as possible, don't forget the traveling merchant. She has had some wares that have been a real game changer for me, including the red cabbage, which is the normal holdup for people trying to get the community center done in year one. I have been able to complete bundles without spending extra money planting trees or having to go to the desert. Sometimes forgotten by me, but pay attention to when she's around and keep your pocket money on you too. They are all often very overpriced. You can find her in Cinder Snap Forest on Fridays and Sundays, and you can even find her in the night market during the winter time, so don't forget it. If you know you're planning on fishing all day at one specific spot, or are planning on spending a lot of time in one area working on stuff, put a chest down. It has been so helpful to me, especially when you don't have the funds to get the biggest backpack upgrade. I like to use it to hold on to things I'm collecting like green algae and seaweed so I can stock up to make the fish ponds and remember not to eat them. Also, if you're planning on spending a lot of time fishing or even mining, why not make the most of your time and get some multitasking done? This is done by so many min-max players, but even I as a casual have found it extremely useful. 
put your furnaces, recycling machines, whatever, down by where you are spending your time. You can smelt some bars while you're fishing or pop in any trash you find and then keep the extras in that box you place down when your backpack is full. I love using it at the mines. Every five levels, once I get an elevator, I hop up to the entrance and get the next round of bards going. Such a time saver and a game changer. For most players, the coop is the first farm building purchased from Robin as it is part of a quest. But before you build a coop or barn, consider building a silo first. Not only is it low cost in resources, once you have the silo, you can harvest hay from grass with your scythe and start stocking up to feed your animals. It saves you the money of having to buy hay from Marnie when she's actually open and you won't have to worry about your animals being hungry. I suggest putting a chest inside or near the Cooper barn because you can pull hay out of the hopper to empty the silo and place it in the chest. That way you can stock the silo up again without having to make another one when you have more mouths to feed. Making the right friends has its benefits and I'm not talking about with the marriageable ones. The way to unlock a lot of recipes is through friendship with the villagers and when you're working on becoming friends, you'll get nice little gifts in the mail. I whipped up a handy infographic to show what gifts get sent to you in the mail by who to help me keep track. The link for it is down in the description. Some gifts are, well, not as great as others. I'm talking to you, George. but some can be very helpful. My favorite villager to build friendship with is Emily as she can gift you a couple of things needed for bundles and Gus sends some great food items to you too. They start giving you things at any level greater than zero, but the likelihood is more the friendlier they are with you. So keep an eye on that mailbox. The crab pot bundle in the community center can actually be completed without having a crab pot at all. Four out of five of these can be forged at the beach, and the last one you can get without a crab pot is, well, a crab. You'll want to take down any rock crab in the mines that you find, as they have a 15% chance of dropping a crab. Ancient fruit can be one of the most profitable plants you can grow in Stardew Valley. It's rare to find the artifact to make into seeds, but one of my favorite ways to find one is by taking out the bugs and grubs you find in the mines in the first 30 levels. There is a 0.5% chance to find one, but these levels are crawling with bugs, so don't pass them up. And if you can, don't run away from the bug swarms because this can be a game changer, especially if you find it in your first spring. When you're in the mines, you'll often see crates and barrels. Be sure not to pass by these in the early game. Often they hold very helpful items like gems, hardwood, and even better, weapons and gear to help you survive. It doesn't take any extra energy, but can be very rewarding. When you hit the frozen levels in the mines, another thing to break with your sword are these crystals. Not many people know this, but there is actually a small chance that you can find a refined quartz bar from breaking these large crystals. Some random levels in the mines will have mine cart tracks running through them. It's a good idea to head to the end of the tracks because these levels hold mine carts filled with coal. And often a ladder is at the end of the track as well. And contrary to what I believed for the longest time, luck doesn't affect everything. One thing it doesn't affect is the rare drops from monster kills and the amount of monsters in the caves. I have still found some pretty good items on bad luck days. And I've even been knocked out by mobs on good luck days. Bad luck will lower the chances of finding either a ladder or extra coal from breaking rocks and the lowers the chances of finding gem nodes on the next level you go down to. Apart from that, you should be just fine. Just be prepared and try not to let luck decide what you want to do with your day. If you'd like a more in-depth look about what luck is and isn't, I suggest checking out the Stardew Valley Wiki and also this Reddit post from a few years ago that gives you a good look about what luck does and doesn't affect. I'll leave links to both of those down below in the description. 
So, did you learn something new? Most of these tips I've been using for quite a while, and a few have been pointed out to me since the update came out. I really hope these tips and tricks have been helpful to you, and be sure to leave me a comment with your favorite one. Be sure to subscribe to my channel if you like videos like this, leave a like, and share the video with a friend that might learn something from this too. I'm Wickedy, thanks for hanging out in the valley with me, and I will see you next time. Bye!